Ah, and we are live! Welcome back to Takes by Fans. We have a great show for you today, as always. We are live every single day at noon Eastern. Now, if you want to watch live, head over to twitch.tv slash Takes by Fans. If you want to watch but not live, head over to our YouTube channel. We post our episodes and clips of the show there on a daily basis. And if you just want to listen and not watch, we are on podcasting apps. And folks, folks, Mr. Apple, they finally let us in the big club. So now we are officially on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Folks, come on. However you want to listen, we've got you covered. However you want to watch, we've got you covered. So all three facets of media, live, later, listen, folks. Uh, it's takes by fans that we're live day, every day at noon Eastern. That's what you need to know. So whether you want to watch or listen, we've got you covered, folks. Alrighty, today is Monday, and oh boy, what a great day of football yesterday. I mean, Dolphins getting the win, Jets getting their first win. We had to talk about the Rams, folks. Oh boy, Every, nobody wanted to be the team that lost to the Jets, and the Rams, they now have that burden, and uh, we've got a lot to talk about them. Um, Cleveland looked pretty good last night. What else? We got the Chiefs-Saints game, a little bit more competitive than I thought it would be. Um, and yeah, so just some great games, and we're going to break them all down today day on the show that's what we do on Mondays during the week we got to kind of get our solid kind of ground floor in uh, so we can start talking about week 16 a little bit later in the week, but we have to know what happened, you know, this week. So we break all the games down today on the show, and we'll give you our money maker for today's game, uh, uh, Steelers Bengals. It should be a blowout, and uh, you know, so we'll preview that game at the end of the show. But before we get into all that, just a few stories we do need to take a quick look at. So we'll start here. <clears throat> Panthers, they fire their general manager. Now, um, this is huge. This is kind of this is kind of big because this Panthers team, they're kind of in a little bit of a rebuild. They found their coach, they find the, they find their quarterback, and now they're just find, trying to find their general manager. And look at this quote by the owner of the Panthers. Here it is on the on um here it is. I'll just read the tweet. Panthers owner David Tepper says Matt Rule will be involved in the general manager search. That's fantastic. Getting great input. And I think Matt Rule, um, he's kind of a good coach, folks. I'm, I'm big into this Panthers next season. They're going to be a dark horse. I, I They might not even be a dark horse. I think they're just going to be a regular horse, folks. They're going to be good, and I, I have them making the playoffs next year. Uh, what Teddy Bridgewater and Matt Rule is doing, I mean, this was a one-possession game last week, folks. I mean, they keep the games close. That's why I'm kind of buying into Matt Rule. Now, the next two weeks are going to speak volumes on Matt Rule. Does he play Christian McCaffrey even though he's healthy, but the season's at a loss? Are they still going to be competitive in these last two games? I mean, folks, when you're in a rebuild, you have to start establishing a winning culture. That's what a lot of teams kind of forget to do. Oh, let's tank. Let's go 0 and 16. Let's go 1 and 15. Yeah, you get your draft pick. But now you haven't established that winning culture. So now, you know, you're kind of wasting your early years of your kind of star player, which is probably a quarterback. That's why you tanked. So you're wasting his good years. Haven't established that winning culture. Now comes, you know, year three or four where you have to kind of decide, is this man the man of the future before you pay him his first big contract and you haven't even established a winning culture. So you're wasting this man's prime. So this is what a lot of teams forget to do. Build the winning culture as, as you're rebuilding. And the Panthers are doing it perfectly. I'll read this quote by the Panthers owner. Um, to think that you can that you can do uh, have success without some sort of alignment is nuts. So to not have a head coach with some input into, you know, the decision to hire a general manager, um, it's stupid. And the, the Panthers owner does not want to be stupid. So this is fantastic. Matt rule is going to get a general manager or have some input on a general manager, get him the pieces that he wants, try to, you know, be on the same wavelength. As long as the owner, general manager and head coach are all on the same kind of wave wavelength, the, the, the team should strive in the next, you know, three, five years. And uh, I, I'm, I'm really big into this Panthers team come next year, folks. Everything's starting to look up. And Chris McCaffrey, when he's back healthy next season, I mean, that's kind of what they're miss missing. Maybe a little bit of a better defense as well. But I think they had the offensive side of the ball figured out, um, you know, Teddy Bridgewater is great. Christian McCaffrey is going to be fantastic. Mike Davis, Mike Davis as the backup. And then you got DJ Moore and Curtis Samuel. As your wide receivers, Teddy Bridgewater is making it work already, folks. They've got four wins and are competitive in every game. Love the Panthers next year, folks. 
All right. <clears throat> Saints, man, I, I didn't like Drew Brees starting this week. Saints quarterback Drew Brees, he's not 100%, but, quote, but I'm on my way after the loss against the Chiefs. So you start Drew Brees, they lose, and he's still not even 100%. So now he, you got a banged-up quarterback, not going to have that first round by. He's never going to be fully healthy, and now what? What? I mean, he's going to be banged up going into the playoffs, and you lose first round, and now we're going to have another kind of Saints rule. Remember the pass interference? That's why we had we, we, uh, the game was allowing pass interference replays during last season. That was because of the Saints. So what rule are we going to have now? Quarterbacks um, can't play unless they're 100% cleared by like every doctor in America. So is that what is that the rule that we're going to get for the playoffs for the Saints this year? Then I like Drew Brees starting this week. Start Taysom Hill. And now if the Saints and Chiefs match up in the Super Bowl, I mean, the Chiefs have kind of a full game of tape with the Saints against them on tape so they can prepare for that. Whereas uh, if the Saints kind of took it, e with, took it easy with Drew Brees, got him 100%, started Taysom Hill against the Chiefs yesterday, then if these teams, you know, met in the Super Bowl, the, the Chiefs would only have tape on Taysom Hill and not the Saints, you know, against them. So now I think they're at a disadvantage at the Super Bowl. They're at a disadvantage going into the playoffs, and it's all for what? Not? Nothing. They lost this game against the Chiefs, so why start Drew Brees? I think Taysom Hill, I mean, they play Taysom Hill a decent amount. He still scored the ball a couple of times. So I, I think really Taysom Hill should have started this game, folks. Unfortunate. Alrighty, those are all the stories that we just needed to quickly cover. Now let's start talking about what happened yesterday in the first matchup that we are going to talk about is Texans and Colts and folks, folks, this game ended exactly how the first meeting ended. Texans down seven or down six, and you know, with the first meeting, and they're on like the three yard line going in for the game tying or game winning touchdown, and they fumble on like the one yard line. The first game it was Des Deshaun Watson, in this game it's Kiki Cutie fumbling literally at the one yard line at the end of the game. Look at this, folks. We're talking 28 seconds left. They're literally on Indianapolis's like 13 yard line. Deshaun Watson completes the pass to Kiki Cutie. He's at the two. He's going in for the end zone, and the Colts punch it out, recover, game over. Texans lose again in this style of fashion. I mean, this is this is why we were kind of bailing on the Texans a couple weeks ago. There's obviously no kind of accountability with their interim head coach, and that's to be expected. That's why there's all these fumbles, all these, you know, miscues at the end of games when you can go in, like, win or tie games. You're making these big, you know, miscues. So there's no, you know, no accountability here with the Texans. Um, Deshaun Watson's really their only good piece. Everybody else is fumbling the ball or not making the plays. Let's start here with Deshaun Watson, 33 of 41 for 373 yards, two touchdowns, no picks, classic Deshaun Watson game, um, but you know, his supporting cast is not the best. David Johnson, they really still can't run the ball. Uh, David Johnson, eight carries for 27 yards, and then Deshaun Watson was the second leading rusher for six carries for 25 yards, so... They really can't run the ball with, like, a running back. That's kind of a big knock on this Texans team. They had the receivers at the beginning of the season, but these last, you know, two, three weeks, they've been dwindling at wide receiver. Um, David Johnson was their leading wide receiver, and he's a running back, folks. 11 receptions for 106 yards. Brandon Cooks was the second leading wide receiver, probably their now their best wide receiver. And, uh, you know, he had six catches for 59 yards, so couple of receivers got into it. Uh, Chad Hansen, he had 55 yards. Kiki Cutie, he had 53 yards and a touchdown, but he also had the game-costing fumble. So, you know, unfortunate. You know, that's kind of what we're seeing from Kiki Cutie. He had that kind of one great game when, when he kind of uh, stepped up into that kind of, you know, big role. I'm kind of, you know, the number two slash number one wide receiver, I guess. Two weeks ago, he played great. Last week, he played not very good. This week, he fumbles on the two-yard line. So Texans, man, Texans, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if their future is bright. They still have to find the head coach. They have a lot of pieces to fill on the offensive side of the ball, kind of a lot of pieces to fill on the defensive end of the ball too. Uh, Deshaun Watson, he's the only good piece there. And I would, uh, I don't know what you do with Deshaun Watson. If he stays in Houston, I don't know, man. I don't think this Houston Texans team is going to be good for maybe two years. They're not going to be like the Panthers, who is going to be pretty much immediately good next year. This Texans team, they've got a lot to figure out. 
All right, let's start talking about this Colts uh, Colts team now. Phillip Rivers, once again, he's not turning the ball over, and that is absolutely fantastic. That, I mean, the Colts, they'll win every game if he doesn't turn the ball over. And this man went 22 of 28, six incompletions for 228 yards, two touchdowns, no picks. Absolutely fantastic. And look at this. This is why I love the Colts, folks. Look at this rushing attack. Jonathan Taylor, absolutely fantastic. 16 carries, 83 yards, and a touchdown. That's five, five yards a carry. And look at this, Nehem Hines, five carries, 42 yards, and he got it done in the running game as well. So that's, this is exactly what I love about the Colts, their running attack, their running attack by committee. It's pretty much the Browns are the best running, running, uh, running backs by committee, and then the Colts are pretty much number two. The Ravens are in a whole different league of their own. That I mean, they they all run the ball. So I mean, yes, they're the best rushing team because that's what they do. Uh, they barely pass. So um, this this Colts running backs, folks, they're very good, and this is why they're going to go deep in the playoffs. And this is why Philip Rivers isn't turning the ball over because he's just relying on the pass game. The pass, uh, the run opens up the pass, folks. So he's just letting Jonathan Taylor run it. He's letting Nehem Hines run it, and then he's throwing it to Nehem Hines, and then you know that opens up the deep throws down the field because the defense is just pushing up trying to stop the run and that's when you get your one-on-one -on -one matchups and Phillip Rivers is taking them because you got T.Y. Hilton you've got Zach Pauskel you got Michael Pittman Jr. as well so some very good uh, players here on this Colts team and I think Phillip Rivers is pretty much their ceiling if he starts turning the ball over this Colts team is not that good and uh, you know the defense is solid for the Colts and when he doesn't turn the ball over Phillip Rivers they pretty much win these games so pretty promising with this Colts team beat the Texans twice now should they have beaten the Texans twice? I mean, it came down to the one yard line pretty much on both these games. So, but hey, the bend but don't break defense bending all the way down to the fourth quarter with one second left on the one yard line. And that's when you step up. Hey, you know, I can respect that. I can respect that. So the Colts get the win here 27 20. The spread was, uh, Colts minus seven, which is pretty funny. You know, it's seven points, and Vegas called it exactly. We kind of called it exactly as well. We we thought that the Texans really only cover the seven if Deshaun Watson goes out of his mind, and he kind of did. 330, 373 yards, three touch, or two touchdowns, no picks. I mean, absolutely fantastic. So they get the seven. It's a it's a it's a push. That's what we got here, <laughs> Colts-Texans. Exactly how the first meeting went. It was kind of crazy, kind of crazy. Alrighty, let's move on to Jets and Rams. And oh my goodness, Jets get the first win and I love it. And folks, 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 I'm on Twitter last night after the Jets won. And everyone's like, uh, all the Jets fans were like, oh, Adam Gase, why would you win the game? And blah, blah, blah. Now we can't get Trevor. Bruh, tanking is the lamest. It's the lamest. You're not establishing the winning culture. Your rebuild now goes from five years to ten years. And you're still not good. Folks, you have to win games. You're one in 13. Okay, you don't get the first pick. That sucks. That just means there's worse teams than you, and that's kind of sad to say, honestly. Uh, you know, one-win teams. You can. You you just can't tank, folk. It's, it's so lame. Yes, you get your player, but. One player does not mean anything. You have an offensive side and defensive side and special teams. That's three facets of the game. So only one player can kind of make an impact on one of those facets. And yes, you know, quarterbacks, they do, you know, handle a lot. They're a huge manager. They're basically, you know, their entire offense. So yes, you do need a good quarterback. But it's not worth tanking and losing and, you know, just not making, you know, your destination, your team kind of attracted to free agents and, you know, your fan base. You know, you haven't won a game. You know, your coaching staff, you haven't established that winning culture yet. So, uh, Jets winning, I like it. I don't like this that, you know, everybody's, you know, rooting for the Jets to tank and throw every game and go 0-16. It's lame, folks. It's lame. So, I congratulate the Jets on winning. I think it's a smart decision. You play to win the game. You don't play to draft future because it, they may not even pan out. Trevor Lawrence could get injured his first season just like Joe Burrow. Who knows if Joe Burrow is going to be the same. Now, is that worth it going 0-16 for a one-and-done quarterback and now you have to try and find another one? And try to do this entire thing over again. Now, I'll tell you what you do. If you want a player, go and get the fucking player. Trade all your draft picks. Give your you know, give your next years. If you want a player that bad, go for broke now. Trade away. You don't have to be the worst seed to get the best seed. Trade up. I mean, 
If you're offering me six picks in a draft for one pick, um, I don't take it because I don't like draft picks. But, you know, the majority of players and coaches and organizations, they love draft picks. That's why you you tank, and that's why you go 0-16. So you get the number one draft pick. I don't like draft picks. They don't pan out. They rarely pan out the way that you expect them to. So I'm not hurting myself now and you know 10 years down the road because you think the Jets are going to be good now that they have Trevor Lawrence it, it, come on is that what they were missing Sam Darnold's not bad and you know he's still not great on this Jets team so you think Trevor Lawrence is just going to instantly come in and fix this Jets organization they need to establish the winning culture Adam Gase he's not even a good head coach so I mean that's who they invest in they invest in Adam Gase to go get Trevor Lawrence he'll ruin him so, Jets get the win. I like it. Now, let's start talking about this Rams team. How the heck do they lose? Because they don't put up a lot of points. They don't put up points. Even when they face the bad teams, we just saw right now with the Jets, even when they face the good teams, they still don't put up points either. They got 20 here, folks. You know you know my rule. They score 24. They barely, rarely ever get over 24, even when they're facing the Jets' defense at home. They put up 20. This is what I'm talking about. This Rams offense, man, it's real shaky. Now, their defense is good. Did they get beat by the Jets? Yes. Is that a knock? Yes. Unfortunate. But, um, you know... You know, teams teams win. Teams are competitive. These are grown men we're talking about. So we're not, you know, too. We're not going to put too much. We're not going to penalize the Rams too much for the Jets lo- or for the Jets beating them at home. But we will penalize them significantly. Not just probably not as much as other people are doing. Um, all right, let's start talking about the Jets now. They score on their first possession, a touchdown. I mean, folks, we know this about the Jets. Um, Sam Darnold goes 22 of 31 for 207 yards, one touchdown, no picks. I mean, nobody played fantastic in this game. The Rams just got beat 200 yards passing by Sam Darnold. What do we got here in the rushing game? Frank Gore, 23 carries for 60 yards in a touchdown. That's two and a half yards of carry. So it's not like he was going beast mode. It's not like he pulled a Derrick Henry or Delvin Cook. He pulled a 30, how old is Frank Gore, 37? He pulled a 37-year-old Frank Gore. That's what the man did, and they still got and they still got B for him. Um, so yeah, the rushing game was nothing special. The passing game was nothing special. Um, it's just they didn't turn the ball over. So that's what the Jets did perfect there. They did not turn the ball over. So I can give them credit there. Now let's look at the Rams. Now can we see what went wrong with them? Jared Goff, twenty-two of thirty-four, two hundred and nine yards, two touchdowns, and a pick. Kind of a classic Jared Goff stat line, maybe besides the pick. But I mean, he doesn't air it out. He doesn't do anything special. Um, the running game for the uh, Rams: Cam Akers, fifteen carries for sixty-three yards. That's decent. Nothing, you know, exceptional, but you know, solid. Let's look at these receivers now. Robert Woods, Cooper Cup are in the top three of leading wide receivers. We got Tyler Higby, the leading wide receiver for the Rams. Four carries, 67 yards and a touchdown. Robert Woods, six six receptions, 56 yards and a touchdown. Cooper Cup, five receptions, 39 yards, no touchdown. So, I mean, this Rams, this is the Rams offense, folks. This is the Rams offense. They did nothing wrong besides... Besides maybe the interception, let's see when that came into play. Second, uh, second quarter, uh, Jets already up 10 nothing, and uh, the Jets go in, um, cash in that interception with a three-point field goal. So they take that interception, they score points off of it, fantastic. That's what you want. That's, that's, that's what you look for with turnovers if the, is the other team cashing in. So Jets did that, and they go up, you know, that's the three points. Rams lose by three. Jared Goff throws an interception, leads to three points. You can trace that back to the ball game, folks. You can. Because this Rams offense, they cannot overcome penalties because their offense is not that explosive. They really they really cannot overcome any any sort of kind of adversity during games. We saw it against the Dolphins. Um, you know, the Dolphins defense just picking Jared Goff and forcing turnovers over and over and over again. The Rams can't overcome that. This Rams offense is super limited. And their defense, yes, it's good, but they just let the Jets put up 23 points. So, can't buy into this Rams team anymore. Tomorrow, we are going to have to probably drop them heavy when we do our power rankings. Do we put the Jets in the top 10? No, that's going a little too wild. But Rams, are, they're going to have to kind of fall heavily because I believe, what are they right now? I think I have them at number 4. I do have them at number 4. This is not a good look. This is not a good look for this Rams team. They're struggling. Um, this is not a good offensive team, folks. This is not a good offensive team for the Rams. 
Alrighty, what else do we got here? Lions and Titans, and oh boy, every single week, I love this Titans team more and more and more and more. This team is putting up 40 points whenever they want. I thought their offense was pretty much, their ceiling would be like 35 points, but they're breaking 40 points. I think this is like the third or fourth time this season they've scored 40 or more points. I think they've scored the more the most points this week, honestly, because the Ravens had 40, and the I think the Titans, yeah, this is... Yes, yes. Oh, no, Buffalo had 48. So Buffalo scored two more points than the Titans this week. But the Titans, the second leading scorer of the week with 46 points. And it's just absolutely fantastic. You would not think like a power running team would be putting up 40 points a game. It's wild. Let's start here. Ryan Tannehill, 21 of 27, 273 yards, three touchdowns, no picks. I mean, this just screams Ryan Tannehill. The, actually, the completion percentage is a little bit higher than what he usually does. Um, that's actually real good by him. Fantastic game. Fantastic game by Derrick Henry. 24 carries, 147 yards, and a touchdown. This man is the best running back in the league, folks. There's no question. This man's the best running back in the league, and he's not even the, mo the highest paid running back in the league. How crazy is that? Zeke Elliott is worth more than this man. Crazy? Crazy. Um, so this man had a great game. Tannehill had a great game. Look at these receivers. Corey Smith. This is what makes the Titans so good. They have two A1 tier one wide receivers in Corey Davis and AJ Brown who can just run streaks. They're deep ball receivers, and that's what this Titans team need. They're all good on the intermediate because they have Ryan Tannehill, who can run. They've got Derrick Henry, who's decent, you know, catching the ball, you know, in the backfield or kind of, you know, in a nice slant or, you know, just kind of five-yard out route. So he, he can run those perfectly. They just need those deep threats, and they've got him with A.J. Brown and Corey Davis. Corey Davis, the leading wide receiver, four receptions, 110 yards, and a touchdown. Absolutely fantastic. Um, then we got a, a, oh, a new re receiver in here, Janu Smith. He's the second leading wide receiver here, five receptions, 52 yards, and then we get A.J. Brown, five receptions, 44 yards, and a touchdown. It's just absolutely fantastic what this Titans team is doing, folks. Um, are they number three right now? I got the, oh, there's there's a big jump coming from the Titans, folks. I may even put them at one. I may even put them at one, folks. I, I, I Do I like them better than the Chiefs? It, it's I could make the I can make the debate I can make the debate I think I love this Titans team and they just run the ball fantastic folks and this is why they're they they were successful last year in the playoffs because you run the ball in the playoffs and that really wins you the games defense and running the ball wins you you know deep playoff runs wins you the Super Bowl so watch out for this Titans team man holy cow what a great game by them last night I mean, look at this. Scoring on their first one, two, three. F uh, scoring touchdowns on their first three possessions. That's absolutely fantastic. They did take a safety, unfortunately. That's not great. But then they come right back and score a field goal on their next possession after the safety. So they basically scored on all three of their possessions. Yes, they had the safety. They probably would have scored on that possession too if they didn't get a bad start starting on their own uh, three-yard line because they recovered a fumble on the defensive end. So... Love this Titans team, man. Their defense getting after it, too. Let's look at these lines. I mean, we've got turnovers. Let's talk about them. Matt Stafford, 22 of 32, 252 yards, one touchdown, no picks. This is a very classic Matt Stafford game. And I also do want to note that this Lions team scored a touchdown on their first drive. Titan, or Jets and Lions scoring on their first drive touchdowns. They do it kind of better than anybody else, honestly. The Titans, they do it. Uh, they did it here. They do it decently. I don't think as often often as uh as the Jets and Lions do cuz the Titans they do kind of get off to some slow starts that's pretty that's probably the one knock on the Titans as we saw against the Steelers and then a couple weeks ago who was it that they got off to a slow start to was it the uh... ooh I'm blanking Unfortunate, but a couple weeks ago, they just got off to that slow start and that's why they lost they won the second half But they lose the first half of uh, the Browns. That's who it was So that's the one knock that we have on the Titans everything else. We absolutely love about them all right, let's start. Let's finish talking about um, these lines here. Chase Daniels comes in the game. When did he come in the game? Matt Stafford got injured. He was a little banged up coming into this game. Unfortunately, doesn't look like he uh, finished the game. How unfortunate. Yeah, we got Chase Daniels coming in here in the fourth quarter, throwing touchdowns or leading to touchdown drives. Yeah, so it looks like Matt Stafford got... Uh, 
got knocked out right here. How unfortunate. About uh, 12 minutes left in the fourth quarter. He exits the game, it appears, and Chase Daniels takes over, and he goes 5 of 6, 55 yards, no touchdowns, a pick. The pick coming right at the end of the game. Really couldn't do anything anyway. It was 25, 46 uh, with how much time left? How much time did this start? Two minutes, yeah. So this is just, you know, desperation. We're just trying to do something. So we're not going to knock uh, Chase Daniels with that interception. Um, do we got any fumbles here? Two fumbles. TJ Hawkinson fumbles and DeAndre Swift. DeAndre Swift, you've got to stop fumbling, man. This is you're a rookie. You 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 don't have that luxury of fumbling. Not even Zeke has the luxury of fumbling, and he's been fumbling a lot this season. So DeAndre Swift definitely has to get that cleaned up. Let's talk about these turnovers with the Lions. Uh, uh, they get that one fumble, unfortunately it leads to a safety for the Titans. So they kind of lost kind of that overall kind of turnover, uh, cause they give up two points and didn't score anything. Let's see where their second fumble comes. And the second fumble comes on the Lions' first possession in the second half. And the Titans couldn't do anything with it. Eight, eight plays, 25 yards, and they have to punt. So that's not good. Tennessee not taking care of the ball after turnovers. That's not great. That's something that we do have to see the Titans kind of improve on hopefully they can kind of get that keyed up these last two weeks going into the playoffs because i'm telling you this titans team is good this titans team is real good folks they're putting up the points damn damn they're putting up points i love it all righty here we go let's move on tampa bay and at and atlanta and atlanta blowing a 17 point lead when have we heard this before folks i don't know what's wrong with this organization why are they blowing leads they got rid of their offensive coordinator after the super bowl because he got a job they just fired their head coach this season they're still blowing leads they did it last week they did it this week what the heck is wrong is it matt ryan is it matt ryan folks is that who we have to look at I don't know. He didn't turn the ball over. So that's good. Let's start here with the Falcons. Matt Ryan, 34 of 49, 356 yards, three touchdowns, no picks. Julio Jones didn't play this week, folks. That's huge. That's so huge for this Atlanta offense, folks. When Julio Jones does a play, they, actually, they play better offensively. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me, but that's how they play. I don't get it. Um, Todd Gurley didn't do anything. He only rushed one time. Ish Smith was, uh, or Ito Smith was the leading rusher, but he only rushed six times for 24 yards. So this is what, this must be what it is. Falcons, you had a 17 point lead going into halftime and you still only have six, seven, eight. Um, Brian Hill had five rushes, but it goes nowhere. So their running game is absolutely atrocious. Just run the ball, run out the clock. And they didn't do that. They barely ran the ball this game. When we have like 13 rushes this game, 13 rushes when you have a 17 point lead in the first half. It's 17 nothing going into halftime, folks, and you still only have 13 rushes. That's not good. Why is Matt Ryan throwing the ball 49 times? Relax a little bit. Start eating up the clock. Learn how to play with the lead. This Atlanta, nobody knows how to play with the lead in Atlanta. We just crowned them the blown lead champions last week because of their blown lead against the Chargers. Man, now I'll give them this. The, the Falcons offense played better than I thought they would. I didn't think they were going to put up 27 points, but they did. So I'll give them credit for that, but still... Let's talk about these receivers for the Falcons. Kevin, Kelvin Ridley, we already know this man's good, and this is just reiterating it here. 10 receptions, 163 yards and a touchdown. Russell Gage, 5 receptions, 68 yards and a touchdown. I mean, Matt Ryan is going to his weapons when Julio Jones isn't on the field, so that's fantastic. Um, but they don't translate to wins, so I don't know. Matt, They've got to make the change. Atlanta has to make a change, folks. It's not getting any better. Interim head coach, same head coach, new offensive coordinator. It doesn't matter. There's still blowing leads and you have to get to the root of this problem folks you have to get to the root of this problem before next season starts because we can't go through this again folks this atlanta fan base this atlanta organization they cannot take more blown leads folks they cannot do it so they got to figure it out i don't know i think we have to chalk it up to maybe Matt Ryan, or maybe it's the offensive line, or maybe it's whoever's calling the running plays. Maybe they're still there. The running play coach is still there for some reason. Get that man fired. You need to start calling more running plays. 
All right, let's talk about the Bucks because they struggled mightily in the first half. That's why they put up no points, and that's why Tom Brady still ended up with 390 yards passing. Holy cow. 31 of 45 for 390 yards, two touchdowns, no picks. Leonard Fournette had a decent running attack. Leonard Fournette had more rushes than that Atlanta did their entire game with all their running backs, and even Matt Ryan, I think, maybe ran one. So Leonard Fournette goes 14 carries for 49 yards and two touchdowns. That's that's how you do it, folks. That's how you commit to the run. 14 by one player. Atlanta does not do that, even with the lead. Um, Mike Evans, leading wide receiver. Antonio Brown, second leading wide receiver. Holy cow, I have not seen Tom Brady do this. Mike Evans, leading wide receiver. Six carries for 110 yards, no touchdowns. Antonio Brown, five receptions, 93 yards, and a touchdown. So going to his actual wide receivers, I love it. And now we get Cameron Brady, third leading wide receiver. I can get behind that. Now you go to your tight ends. Four receptions, 54 yards, no touchdowns. Then Chris Godwin, he's got four uh, receptions for 36 yards and a touchdown. So just going to all their pieces, fantastic. Going to your wide receivers, even more fantastic. That's what we want to see, Tom. That's what we want to see. Now let's talk about their drive summary in the first half. Five plays on their first drive, only going 26 yards and half the punt. Then their next drive, six plays, 14 yards, half the punt. Third drive, three plays, negative one yards. That's a three and out, folks. They punt. Their fourth drive, nine plays, 23 yards, punt. So, and they just could not get anything going. And Atlanta put up 17 points. So, very well done but that, for them. But look at this. Once again, Matt Ryan having to kind of settle for field goals, not getting it done in the red zone. We see them kind of stalling. Um,. Or no, this was the touchdown drive, so we'll give them there. Uh, what was these uh, field goal drives? Oh, they scored two field. They scored two touchdowns, so I'm bugging. I'm bugging. I thought they had two field goals in the first half, so I'm bugging. Matt Ryan was finally able, able to kind of drive the length of the field. We see 10 plays, 65 yards on a touchdown drive. 8 plays, 75 yards on a touchdown drive. So Matt Ryan getting there, liking to see that, not turning the ball over. Fantastic. Uh, second, second half, what happened with the Falcons? Why did they blow this lead? Let's see. Uh, they scored a touchdown on their first drive. Fantastic. Um, but then they punt. They punt. Three and out. Three and out punts there. Not driving. Settling for this field goal. Here we go again. Having to do a 52-yard field goal. Okay, so Matt Ryan wasn't able to kind of drive in the second half in a punt. And, you know, the Bucks are scoring touchdowns while the Falcons are punting in the second half. There's two halves to be played, folks. We we see a lot of teams struggle in the first half, come out and win the second half. Tom Brady did it here. We've seen the Titans do it over and over again. We've seen who else do it? The Dolphins do it. They gave up, you know, they scored no points last week. They did it. They scored no points against the Chargers. And then they come out in the second half and win the game in the second half, scoring the ball. So, uh, you know, we see teams do that. But we do want to see you have a full, complete game. Um, so we still have to wait for that with the Bucs. Are we buying the Bucs because of this? No. They beat an Atlanta team who's notorious for blowing leads. So we're not kind of – you. We're, we'll, we'll give the Bucs their credit for winning this game, but it, we're not giving them any additional credit for winning this game. Tom Brady not performing until the second half. That doesn't excite me. Um, beating the Falcons doesn't excite me. So uh, we'll still take it a little easy with the Bucs. Maybe we put them in the top 10. If somebody falls out, we'll put them maybe in – in that number 10 but uh you know until they start having a full good game Tom Brady's you know on the money the entire game this defense is on the money the entire game we're not going to buy this Bucks team as a legit kind of Super Bowl contender we're just not going to count that yet Alrighty, here we go. Moving on. Jags and Ravens. And oh my goodness. Ravens absolutely destroying. And they were looking good in the process. So we'll start here with the Ravens. Lamar Jackson doing Lamar Jackson things. But upgraded even better. Look at this man. 17 of 22 for you. Listen to this, folks. Are, are you all ready? 243 yards. Yes, you heard me correctly. This man threw for 200 yards. Let's get it. Three touchdowns, one pick. Ugh. Eh, the one pick came out in their first drive, and what did they do? They got a safety because of it. So, I mean, what is going on with this? Teams throwing interceptions and getting sacked for the safeties. This is the second time we've just seen it, folks, this week. So, kind of crazy. But, um, you know, Ravens, they kind of move forward. They didn't kind of get, you know, oh, man, we threw an interception on the first drive. The game's over. They got right back on it. Their next drive, touchdown, bingo. Their next drive after that, touchdown, bingo. Their next drive after that, field goal, bingo. Their next drive after that, 
touchdown bingo. Their next drive after that, missed field goal, but it was kind of, was this a long one? Let's see. 57 yards. That's got to be made. Come on. Come on. Anything 55 win words need, needs to be made, folks. I get this is 57, so we'll give them a slight pass, but not a big one. Um, and then after halftime, what are the Ravens doing? Touchdown on their first drive. Bingo. Touchdown on their second drive. Bingo. Turnover on downs on their third drive after halftime. Let's see what they're trying to do here. Fourth and 20. They went for it on fourth and 20. Maybe a fake punt because we got uh, T. Huntley pass incomplete. So a little bit of a different formation there. Oh, no. Huntley came in on this drive. Am I bugging? T. Huntley. This man was playing quarterback a little bit. Tyler Huntley, they said, we are so up big. We don't even need Lamar Jackson anymore. This is the fourth quarter. Yeah. Okay. So Lamar Jackson gets benched in the fourth quarter for being so freaking good, making it a 40 to seven game, just absolutely blowing out the Jags. So T Huntley comes in. Let's talk about this man. Two of four for seven yards. Okay. Okay, tried to go for it on 4th and 20. Couldn't get it there. We may look at that on Wednesday. Try to see that pass. Actually, let's see it right now. Let's see it right now. Let's see what T. Huntley's doing on 4th and 20 because this is interesting. <laughs> what are the Ravens doing? They, they just get so bored. They got so bored. They're like, we're going 4th and 20. We don't care. Let's see if we can bring up this play very, very quickly. Ravens. Ravens. Um, Jags. Yeah, here we go. All right. <clears throat> I mean, we're not going to talk about the Jags too much, so we can waste a little bit of time here trying to queue up this play. Here we go. Fourth quarter, fourth and 20. Where are we going here? All righty. I'm not seeing it. Damn, why am I not seeing it? I got third and 29. Fourth and 20. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Let's see what we get here. They're on the 39-yard line, so I do like the attempt. It is a long field goal. He just missed a long one. Let T. Huntley air this out. Uh, a little disappointing. Nobody was even there. He aired it out, but literally nobody was even there. I mean, it couldn't even get picked. That's how far nobody was there. So, unfortunate. But, hey, give the kids some credit. I mean, they're up 40-7. to 7. They don't care. There's four minutes left. I, I like the attempt. I like the attempt. Um, all right. Let's talk about the Jags now. I mean, oh, no, we didn't even finish talking about the Ravens. Uh, J.K. Dobbins, Gus Edwards, Lamar Jackson. Let's start talking about him because this rushing attack is fantastic. J.K. Dobbins, 14 carries, 64 yards and a touchdown. Gus Edwards, 9 carries, 42 yards and no touchdown. And Lamar Jackson, 10 carries, 35 yards, one touchdown. So this running back by committee, Ravens do it the best, folks. They're in a league of their own. And then maybe we go Browns and Colts at number two and three. But, um, I mean, what do they got here? 150 yards, basically rushing. Absolutely fantastic. Split up between three different backs in the quarterback. I mean, this Ravens team, they beat you. And then Lamar Jackson goes and throws 200 yards as well. So, let's see who he was throwing to this week. He got all of his receivers back healthy just in time. Uh, they cleared COVID kind of game day. Marquise Brown, six, care, or six receptions, 98 yards, no touchdowns. Mark Andrews. Five receptions, 66 yards, and a touchdown. Gus Edwards, two receptions, 36 yards, no touchdowns. And then he was slinging it around a little bit. Uh, he, what do we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different players. Ravens receivers catching balls and the best one of all uh, Des Bryant one reception 11 yards in the touchdown throwing up the axe love that this man is officially back in the league and he capped it off with the signature axe and the signature touchdown and you love to see it back in the league hasn't played since 2017 I believe so to see this man back and scoring oof it's good so I mean Lamar Jackson getting better throwing the ball I mean this was perfect this was probably the best case scenario for the Ravens this week just absolutely blowing out the Jags getting kind of better passing the ball getting Des Bryant incorporated into the offense a little bit more here so he's good to go the next two weeks and into the playoffs if they can make it because they're right now they're not in it's crazy to think about a 9-5 team not being in the playoffs right now at this moment but uh you know they're kind of outside looking in Alrighty, what do we got here? Uh, let's look at these fumbles. Lamar Jackson did fumble twice. 
Patrick Macari fumbled once and J.K. Dobbins fumbled once, but they didn't lose any of those. So that is something that, you know, that's kind of what the Ravens do, uh, you know, with a lot of, you know, run options and read options and everything's kind of very at the line of scrimmage. You know, that's where the fumbles kind of can arise. And, uh, you know, as long as the Ravens aren't losing those fumbles, we won't penalize them too much. But that is something that you do kind of need to keep in your mind when you're watching, rooting, betting for this Ravens team. They can fumble fumble a lot because that's what they do. They just run the ball. Um, all right. We'll talk about the Jags very, very quickly because they put up 14 points in a non-competitive game. So not really interested in any of these stats here. Gardner Minshew, 22 of 29 for 226 yards, two touchdowns, no picks. Wow. Wow. I would not. I mean, if you showed me that kind of stat line, I would not expect this to be an absolute blowout by Jacksonville. So Gardner Minshew still looking decent himself. It's just the Jags defense could not stop Baltimore. And I mean, we can't knock the Jags for that because it's hard to stop this Ravens offense. I mean, even the Steve. Steelers, I mean, back when they faced in their first meeting, you know, Steelers were the best defense in the league, and the Ravens turned it over four times and, you know, only won or only lost by like four points. So it's tough to stop this defense even or this Ravens offense even when you're kind of, uh, you know, doing all the right things, Tur getting turnovers, cashing in on those turnovers. Ravens don't care. Ravens and Chiefs don't care. They'll erase deficits. They'll erase, you know, mistakes just like this. That's the high-powered offense that these teams have. All right, we'll finish the Jags here. James Robinson, 16 carries for 35 yards. I mean, Jags in a loss are running more times than Atlanta with a 17-point lead going into halftime. I don't want to even talk about Atlanta anymore, folks. Getting a little redundant there, blowing all the leads. Can't even trust them. How unfortunate. Um, and then we'll just say DJ Chark, leading receiver, four receptions, 53 yards. I mean, uh, this is not competitive. The Jags were not competitive this game, folks. Not good. Alrighty, here we go. Let's move on. Eagle or New England Patriots and the Miami Dolphins. And I mean, folks, this game went exactly how we predicted. We said the Patriots were probably not going to put up more than ten points. They put up twelve, so we were pretty much right on the money. They scored two points, uh, but that's our thinking was correct. This Patriots offense is not good. Cam Newton, seventeen of twenty-seven, two hundred nine yards, no touchdowns, no picks. Should have had a fumble. Luckily, kind of got bailed out a little bit kind of touched out of bounds or touched a player who went out of bounds. Not The ball didn't even go out of bounds. It touched a player who went out of bounds. Kind of crazy. So they get bailed out there. Uh, Jacoby Myers still fumbles, and we still recover that. So Dolphins still end up getting a turnover. Fantastic. Um, but, yeah, uh, the running game was kind of decent. I'll give them that. Sony Michelle, 10 carries for 74 yards, but they couldn't capitalize with any points. Cam Newton, he ran nine times for 38 yards. Decent, but once again, he fumbled, kind of bailed out a little bit. No touchdowns. I mean, this team did not – they didn't score any touchdowns. It's just all field goals. So fantastic by the Dolphins, shutting them out, bending and not breaking. Yes, we'll give you, all right, one big play here, one big play there. But we're not going to let you score seven out of it. And we're going to make you earn those three points that you, you know, may get. Because, you know, we're going to make those long field goals for you. So this Dolphins defense is fantastic. The Dolphins were missing all of their weapons, folks. They had, I mean, let's just talk about it. We'll talk about their stats. Tua, 20 of 26, 145 yards, no touchdowns, and the pick. The pick was a little bit his fault, got pressured a little bit, kind of threw it, not very accurately, and it's packed, picked off in the end zone, even worse. But ever since that moment, he was just a game manager, and that's what he needed because he had nobody to go to. So he just needed to be a game manager and let the running attack take over, and that's what it did. Salvin Ahmed, he has been a huge, huge factor for this Dolphins offense. You know, our running backs have been injured all season, and this man is stepping up, so very well done. Once again, this is what I'm talking about. You can't just tank and go 0-16 and get your quarterback. Do what the Dolphins did. You get your coach, you kind of, you know, when you know you kind of tank in the first half of the season but you're still building that winning culture even when you're losing games they win kind of like their last four out of five in the season and now they've got nine wins they drafted their player this isn't even a rebuild anymore they finished the rebuild in like two seasons how crazy the Jets are going to be rebuilding for 10 years because they're not building that winning culture winning culture is everything folks why do you think everybody's just buying in why do you think the Dolphins could go here and put up 22 points offensively without 
every single one of their weapons, folks. Come on. It's the winning culture. It's everybody buying in. It's it's establishing that next man up mentality. And Brian Flores does it better, as, as good as any coach in the league does it, folks. We've seen it time and time again. We're talking rookie quarterbacks. I mean, Justin Herbert right now is better than Tua. And Justin Herbert's got like four wins. Winning culture. Coaching. Anthony Lynn. He's not a good coach. They've got the pieces there. And they still can't win games. They still can't close out game so winning culture is everything stop tanking stop going 0-16 Dolphins didn't even tank they were trying in all those games last season and they won like five six games so that's not tanking hate tanking folks it's the lamest thing I would never intentionally ever lose a game I would never intentionally you know stall a drive that's lame to me folks it's lame Alrighty, uh, Salvin Ahmed, we said 23 carries, 122 yards, one touchdown. I mean, folks, holy cow. And then we had Matt Breed at 12 carries, 86 yards, running back by committee, over 200 yards. Yes, sir, sign me up. I'll take that every day of the week. Now, who was <laughs> who was Tua throwing to? Let me see if you all have ever heard of any of these players. Y'all tell me. All right, leading wide receiver for the Dolphins, Durham Smythe. Ever heard of him? Um, second leading wide receiver for the Dolphins, Lynn Bowden. Ever heard of him? Third leading wide receiver, Isaiah Ford. Ever heard of him? Fourth leading wide receiver for the Dolphins, Mac Highland. Mac Highlands. Ever heard of him? Fourth lead or fifth leading wide receiver for the Dolphins, Adam Shaheen. Ever heard of him? Fifth or sixth leading wide <laughs> leading wide receiver, Patrick Laird. Ever heard of him? And the last leading wide receiver for the Dolphins, Salvin Ahmed. We know him because he's the running back that we just talked about. So, folks, this man was going to nobody. He had nobody to go to and still made it work with the rushing game. Well done. I got to give props or props to the offensive coordinator for the Dolphins calling a fantastic game plan. Didn't try to just, you know, have Tua throw it without any wide receivers to catch it. Just focused on the running game. We got Matt Breida back this week. Salvin Ahmed had a fantastic game. So, well done to the Dolphins overall. And, um, you know, the Dolphins, they forced a lot of fumbles in this game. They got one turnover. Fantastic work. Um, so the Dolphins, just, yeah, just very, very well done this game. Just keeping at it. Scored no points in the first half. Got it figured out in the second half. And, you know, never looked back since then. So well done by the Dolphins defense holding this Patriots, this poor Patriots offense to only field goals. And the Dolphins offense finally got it figured out. So very well done. Alrighty, Bears, Vikings. Now let's go to this matchup. And folks, 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 why the heck was Mitch Trubisky ever, ever benched? We can, we can say that. You know, if you want to say that Nick Foles is you know a better quarterback than Mitch Trubisky, okay, you can say that. I may not agree, but I understand it. I can you can make the argument, and I can maybe buy in a little bit. But nobody can deny the fact that whenever Mitch Trubisky is on the field, they just put up more points. They score more points, so the offense is working in some capacity. Whether it's the running game is better because Mitch Trubisky is out there, or Mitch Trubisky. Trubisky is just ma making better reads than Nick Foles is because they're putting up points. Nick Foles has never put up 33 points in back-to-back -back games. I'll tell you that. He can barely put up 20. So the fact that Mitch Trubisky, I mean, this man was benched midway third game. How crazy is that, right? I mean, folks, he won the first two games, and they benched him on his first pick in game number three. How crazy is that? I think Matt Nagy pulled the trigger a little bit too quickly on that one. Yeah, you may have lost that game number three, but you were still competitive, and you were still putting up points. Nick Foles has never put up as many points as Mitch Trubisky has, and uh, we see it here this game. Mitch Trubisky, his second game back, third game back? third game back I think and they put up points this week that's what I'm talking about folks fantastic when the Bears put up points the defense buys in and they usually win the games when they put up 30 points I mean teams usually put win games anyway when they put up 30 points but you know this Bears team they do it as well so the Bears keep their playoff hopes alive. This basically knocks out the Vikings. Uh, so very well done to Chicago. Going on the road. Fantastic work. And, you know, this is kind of what we're saying about this of this Vikings offense. We'll, we'll start out here with their stats because their stats look good. If you just kind of looked at the stat line, you'd be like, oh, they probably won. Um, Kirk Cousins, 24 of 35, 271 yards, still slinging it. Two touchdowns. He did have a pick. Let me guess. It came in the second half. Let's see. His pick came in the fourth quarter on their last drive, trying to kind of win the game. He throws an interception on Chicago's 33-yard line. Let's see this one. It's third and four with seven seconds left, so this possibly could be a Hail Mary. Kirk Cousins, this is a Hail Mary. All right, we're not going to penalize him too much on this one. 
We won't penalize them. Hail Mary attempt. That's when the interception comes. All right. <clears throat> All right, now let's talk Dalvin Cook. 24 carries for 132 yards, one touchdown. We know this. I mean, they put up the uh, they put up the points. They just can't win games because of it. I don't get it. It's real kind of bizarre. Anybody fumble? Kirk Cousins did once, but they didn't lose it. So they played a clean game. Finally, the Vikings didn't really turn the ball over in the second half, and they still lose the game. So we could never trust this Vikings offense. We really can't even trust the Bears offense. We stayed completely away from this game. But, uh, yeah, this Vikings team, man, I don't know what's going on with them. Last year, Kirk Cousins looked great. They made it to the playoffs. This week, or this season, six wins. Awful the first half of the season. The offense is trash the second half of the season, giving up points. Points, giving up turnovers um I don't know what's going on with them folks I truly don't I don't think Kirk Cousins is good I think he had kind of an outlier season last year because he had Stephon Diggs now Stephon Diggs goes to Buffalo and Josh Allen's having a fantastic uh year it's Stephon Diggs we have to start giving this man credit um we'll, we'll have to keep tabs if Stephon Diggs ever leaves Buffalo how mid or how Josh Allen looks when he's not there we have to start saying that Stephon Diggs is kind of a fantastic receiver. All right, let's talk Bears now. Mitch Trubisky, 15 of 21, barely threw the ball at all. 202 yards, one touchdown, one pick. Where did his pick come from? Let's see where this came from. His interception. Ooh. Oh, bad time interception. So, in the fourth quarter, Vikings just scored, made it a three-point game, and Mitch Trubisky stalls and throws an interception on the six-yard line. Disgusting, Mitch Trubisky. Shame on you. Luckily, the defense of Chicago bails him out again, yet again, and, uh, you know, the Vikings go turnover on downs, trying to go for it on fourth and one on their own 29-yard line, and Mitch Trubisky can't even take advantage of a short field to close out a game and can only get a field goal out of it. <clears throat> unfortunate um well they run they won the game because david montgomery he ran it 32 times 32 times absolutely fantastic love to see it 32 carries for 146 yards and two touchdowns very well done i mean folks you can run the ball 32 times and still win games somebody tell atlanta that i mean the vikings do it they ran it 24 times teams can run more than 14 times folks you can do that and still win and still put up points uh, Bears ran the ball 32 times, put up 33 points. Vikings ran the ball 24 times, put up 27 points. Atlanta, hello, hello. Run the ball. You're up 17 nothing at half. Come on. Um, let's finish these stats out now. Allen Robinson leading the receiver for the Bears. No surprise there. Four receptions, 83 yards. Daryl Mooney, second leading wide receiver for the Bears. Four receptions, 49 yards, one touchdown. So, uh, Mitch Trubisky, they took the ball out of his hands, and they win the game correlation i think so i think so heavily all righty a couple more games left let's keep it going seattle and washington and oh no 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 oh, washington dwayne haskins i wanted this man to perform a little bit better this man threw the ball 55 gosh darn times holy cow now he threw two interceptions uh 38 out of 55, 295 yards, kind of dink and dunk for 38 completions. One touchdown, two interceptions. Let's see where they came, and I guarantee they're killer. I guarantee they're killer. Uh, first interception came when they were driving a little bit at Seattle's 27-yard line. Or Actually, we're not going to watch this because we'll probably watch Dwayne Haskins on Wednesday. So, actually, let's watch this first one. We'll watch this first one. Um, here we go. Dwayne Haskins. I mean, 6 nothing game. Dwayne Haskins at the 27. Come on. You cannot throw an interception here. Kind of tipped up. Not 100% his fault, but he did still throw it into double coverage kind of late. Nothing was really open here. Tried to force it. And the defense just, you know, kind of tips it up. The receiver, I think, tipped it up himself. So, unfortunate. Got to make a little bit of a better decision. I mean, that's tight coverage. That's very, very tight coverage. I don't even know if I trust, like, Drew Brees or um, Tom Brady to really make that throw. So, tough throw there. That's his first interception. His second interception comes in the third quarter. Once again, they were driving a little bit. Not too much, actually. So, Throws an interception and Seattle cash. No, they can't cash in. So well done by the doll or by the Washington's defense for you know 
making it kind of, you know, a wash with the interception. So, unfortunately, the offense just really couldn't do anything all game. They had three points going into halftime, and then they scored, you know, a couple points here. Had a chance to go and do something, game-winning touchdown drive. They got all the way down to Seattle's 37-yard line, but couldn't do anything past there. So, Dwayne Haskins, a little bit of a poor performance there. They asked him to do a lot, and, uh, you know, he couldn't do it. So, unfortunate there. Kind of interesting that they passed it so many times there. A little interesting. 55 pass attempts for Dwayne Haskins. I mean, this Washington team doesn't have anything special at receiver. Yeah, they got Terry McLaurin, but are you going to go to him 55 gosh darn times? I mean, that'd be insane. So, I don't know having Dwayne Haskins. I, I don't know if that's a great game plan. Um, I mean, folks, if you put Alex Smith throwing the ball 55 times, I don't think he's doing any better than what Dwayne Haskins did. So that's all kind of relax on, you know, chewing out Dwayne Haskins. You know, he hasn't played in what, like eight, nine weeks. So to throw this man in against Seattle's defense, I mean, that's, that defense was looking real good too. Seattle's defense. So Washington, a little, little, a little iffy on their game plan. Don't know what they were going for. Uh, the running backs, JD McKissick, 13 carries for only 51 yards. Nothing great. Dwayne Haskins ran it three times for 28 yards. So nothing great here. Let's talk about who Dwayne Haskins was getting the ball to. Logan Thomas, is this their tight end? Let's see. It is their tight end. Look at this man. Going to your safety blanket tight end. That's why he's the leading receiver. Um, all right. He had well, how many carries or how many receptions? 12 rece 13 receptions for 101 yards. Terry McLaurin, seven receptions for 77 yards. They did try to get the ball to Terry McLaurin a little bit more. He did have 12 targets. So five incompletions toward that man. Um, Washington's defense. Let's start talking about them now. What do they do? How many sacks do they have? No sacks. You're telling me they had no sacks on Russell Wilson and only what? Two tackles for losses and no turnovers, I believe. So, um, they did have one interception, so I'll give them that one. All right, let's start talking about, uh, so Washington defense, a little bit, uh, a little bit lackluster here. Yes, they held the Seattle to 20, so I'll give them that, but no turnovers, no sacks, no real pressure on Russell Wilson. They did pick him off once, though, so let's start talking about Seattle stats now. Russell Wilson, 18 of 27 for only 121 yards, one touchdown, one pick. What is going on here? What is going on here? So Washington's defense did not let Russell Wilson do anything Russell Wilson wants to do. This is dink and dunk by Russell Wilson, and that is kind of crazy to say. You don't hear that too many times. Um, the running game for uh, Seattle was decent. Two carries for Carlos Hyde, who had 55 yards, and 15 carries for Chris Carson, who had 63 yards. So running back, really not even by committee. Chris Carlos Hyde just kind of broke one off, kind of, probably. Um but uh, Russell Wilson, he ran it six times for 52 yards, one coming on, one rush, I think, ate up about like 30 or 40 yards, so a little bit skewed there. All right, I mean, DK Metcalf, he was a leading wide receiver, but when there's only 100 and, what, 70 yards to be had, not a lot of uh, yards to be had to go around, not even 170. 120, 120 yards. So DK Metcalf, leading wide receiver, five receptions, 43 yards. Tyler Lockett, he had four receptions for 34 yards. Classic. That's who you know Russell Wilson's going to go to, and that's who he went to when he kind of went to passing down the field, you know, a couple of times this game because he really didn't air it out. So a little bit of dink and dunk, but, hey, Seattle got in there. They got the win, got out with the win. That's what we want to see. So Seattle, but he still turned the ball over. Let's see where this came from. His interception, Russell Wilson's interception, came in the fourth quarter in Washington, took advantage and went in for the touchdown and made it a very competitive game. Russell Wilson, man, I don't know what's going on with him. Him throwing all these interceptions this year, it's making me a little nervous, truly, making me a little nervous. This offense, we've seen it struggle a couple of times. Are they getting figured out offensively? That's not good. Washington can figure them out. The Giants can figure them out. I mean, this is not too promising here for Seattle, so we may have to start selling our Seattle stock a little bit. Well done by their defense. They're really kind of winning, winning the game, holding Washington to only 15 points. But, uh, yeah, I think we have to kind of sell some Seattle stock a little bit. Alrighty, Eagles and Cardinals and oh boy, Eagles, man, Doug Peterson, questionable calls a little bit, Jalen Hurts played great, but he did have a rookie mistake, so let's just jump in, we'll start here with the Eagles, Jalen Hurts played a pretty good game, I will give it to this man, 24-44, 338 yards, 3 touchdowns, no picks, he also didn't fumble? 
He did fumble three times, but he didn't lose any. So, hey, you know, you get bailed out a little bit. We'll take it. <clears throat> so Jalen Hurts didn't turn the ball over, but what did he do? A rookie mistake early in the game. Cardinal or Eagles defense gets a fumble, but what happens? They get the safety. That's been kind of the narrative this entire week. Ravens, Titans, Eagles all getting fumbles defensively, but still giving up the safety for some reason. So Jalen Hurts, he did a rookie mistake here. And can we even call it a rookie mistake? Ryan Tannehill made the mistake and Lamar Jackson made the mistake. That's kind of good company to be, you know, in a mistake with. So Jalen Hurts, he makes it. Gives Cardinals two early points here. The spread was six. It was seven points. So the two points here on the safety, the missed extra points, the going for twos. So, I mean, this Eagles team, this this they very competitive here. Yes, it was seven points, but really should have been probably, you know, maybe four, three points. Eagles had the chance at the end of the game to kind of go down and win it. Unfortunately, they stall a little bit. So here we go. Let's take you through their last drive here. Um, Seven-point game, 33-26. Eagles get the ball back on their own. 22-yard line with a minute and 28 seconds left. They drive all the way down. They get to the 31 of the Cardinals, but the drive stalls. They kind of go for you know the touchdowns, and it's just all incomplete. Couldn't kind of hit that kind of Hail Mary 30-yarder. But, um, you know, if you, know, you don't take the safety, Doug Peterson, you know, takes the extra point and actually hit the extra point all the times you know this could have been a three-point game 31 yards this could have been a tie game make it in the overtime unfortunately some you know plays that didn't go the Eagles way and some just maybe questionable play calling you know in situational awareness in situational game time so uh, Eagles can't cover the spread, can't cover the six, unfortunate. Uh, but Jalen Hurts, he played good. He played real good, airing it out, never dink and dunk. You know, took that safety early, but got right back on track. I mean, this Eagles team, they were down. They were down 16 nothing, and Jalen Hurts still kept at it. Touchdowns, leading them down the field, getting them into territory to score points. So we, we commend Jalen Hurts, and I do think Carson Wentz time is over in Philadelphia. It is unfortunate, but you just have to make – have to move on. I've said it time and time again. Carson Wentz, he doesn't feel like he's the man anymore after be being promised he's the man, getting paid like he's the man. You know, Nick Foles comes in. Everybody loves him. There's a statue of him. He's got the Super Bowl ring. He took all of Carson Wentz's hard work, cashed in on it, and everybody throws Carson Wentz to the curb. So I think they just both mutually need to break up. Carson Wentz needs to go somewhere, and he'll still have success. In this Eagles team, they've got a good quarterback in Jalen Hurts, so uh, they just got to move on as well. Uh, let's talk about the running game for the Eagles. Miles Sanders, very good game. Or not a very good game, kind of decent game for him. Miles Sanders, 17 carries, 64 yards, no touchdowns. He never had that big break that we're kind of used, for, uh, used to seeing with him. Jalen Hurts, he ran it 11 times, 63 yards, and he also had a rushing touchdown. So still running the ball, kind of a still a decent dual threat quarterback. So like to see that. Alrighty, now let's see who Jalen Hurts was throwing to because he was getting everybody involved. We've got to go through these. So Zach Ertz, leading receiver, two receptions, 69 yards. That's a tight end, so a little bit of your kind of safety blanket. Alshon Jeffrey, two receptions, 63 yards. Jalen Rager, five receptions, 49 yards. Uh, Quenz Walkins, three receptions, 40 yards. Dallas Goddard, four receptions, 39 yards. Travis Fulgham, two receptions, 30 yards. Miles Sanders, one reception, 26 yards. Greg Ward, four Four receptions, 15 yards. Boston Scott, one reception, seven yards. So this man was literally sharing the ball equally, slinging it, you know, to everybody on the field. So that's great. To see. That's great to see. What you don't want to see is your rookie quarterback just throwing to tight ends and running backs, and you really don't want to see your your rookie quarterback just going to kind of your A1 wide receiver over and over and over and over and over and over again. So this is great, great, great footage here. This is a good Cardinals defense on the road. Jalen Hurts' second game, and he's spreading the wealth around. Very promising here for this Eagles team. They probably may not make the playoffs. This was a huge loss for them. Really needed this one. But uh, next season with Jalen Hurts, I think he, he really can get it done. All righty, Arizona, Kyler Murray. What a game by him. 27 of 36 for 406 yards. Three touchdowns and the pick. Let's see where Kyler Murray's pick came in. Came in the third quarter when the game was 20 to 26. 
And then the Eagles go and cash in and make it 26-26 off the interception. So a killer mistake by Kyler Murray. You know, we kind of see that by Kyler a couple times. So um, the running game by Arizona was decent as well. Chase Edmonds, leading receiver, or leading rusher, 11 carries for 47 yards. Kyler Murray, he only ran eight times for 29 yards and a touchdown. So, you know, it wasn't really eating up the Eagles defense. That's all I heard all week is the Eagles couldn't stop running quarterbacks. I thought it was nonsense, folks. I thought it was really nonsense. Kyler Murray couldn't do anything either. Um, all right, now who it, now Cardinals win. They put up 33 points. Who do you guys think is the leading wide receiver for the Cardinals? I'll give you all a second. Yes, it's DeAndre Hopkins. And, and this man was truly unstoppable, folks. I can't knock DeAndre Hopkins. I'm not knocking the Cardinals. I'm not knocking DeAndre Hopkins. This man was oof. His hands, folks, his hands were absolutely incredible this game. Uh, the Eagles defense, even double coverage, knocking, you know, hitting his hands as he's catching the ball, still holding on to it. DeAndre Hopkins earned this win. He earned all these yards that we're about to say. He earned all these receptions. He earned his touchdown. DeAndre Hopkins, leading wide receiver, nine receptions, 160. 69 yards just an absolute monster folks eagles could not stop him they were doubling him they were tight on him they were loose on him in zone and it still does not matter this man's catching it and catching it and going and yards after catch and touchdowns they could not stop him it was truly it was it was entertaining to watch i'll tell you that even though that i had the eagles plus six and it was kind of you know one of my better bets of the week it was just really deandre hopkins could not be stopped and he earned the win so you know i have to give you know players due when they do good shit and here it is DeAndre Hopkins absolute monster game um, and then so DeAndre Hopkins leading wide receiver with 169 yards the second leading wide receiver is Dan Arnold have you ever heard of him I never even heard of him and I talk Cardinals every single week see a tight end he is a tight end look at this see uh, you know Kyler Murray's going to is you know his weapon his one his one weapon that's it um, so um, what were we saying? Uh, DeAndre Hopkins, 169 yards. The second leading wide receiver, 54. So, you know, big disparity there. Big, uh, big gap there. But uh, Rams or Cardinals defense gets it done. Very well done. Um, you know, holding Jalen Hurts at the end of the game. Couple of punts. Really couldn't score in the third quarter. They did get a touchdown. Fourth quarter drives are stalling. They shut him down. Turnover on downs in the fourth quarter. Eagles were driving, got, you know, fourth and 21 on Arizona's 22-yard line, and they go for it. That's what I'm kind of saying, some questionable play calls. I know the kicker, you know, the holder for the kicker, you know, he wasn't in, so they had Zach Ertz holding the kick. That's why, they, you know, they missed the extra point, and that's why they didn't take this field goal, make it close game, but, you know some questionable play calls there but you know you have to make do what you have to do and if you don't trust your kicking game and you trust Jalen Hurts a little bit more you know you got to go with it so um, Jalen Hurts he's getting some good experience here at the end of the game at the end of the season these are still competitive games so Jalen Hurts is still going out there and competing it's not like you know it's week 17 and he had a good game because you know he was facing the Chiefs who already wrapped up the one seed and they weren't starting anybody Jalen Hurts Cardinals still vying for a playoff Eagles still vying for a playoff they were last week and he played good so Jalen Hurts 338 yards competitive against Kyler Murray and this Cardinals team got to give him credit Alrighty, Chiefs Saints and Saints played a lot better than I thought they would honestly and Drew Brees played a little bit better than I thought he would so we'll start here with the Saints Drew Brees 15 of 34 I mean that's under 15 50% completion percentage so I really do not think this man should have started honestly folks I'll, I've said it time and time again I said it all last week but um, he threw 234 yards three touchdowns in the pick where did the pick come from pick came in the Missed it. Missed it. Where is it? In here in the first quarter on their first drive in the Chiefs cash in with the touchdown. Not good. Not good. Um Alvin Kamara, decent game on the ground. Eleven rushes for fifty four yards. Alrighty. Michael Thomas was out for the Saints, so who was Drew Brees throwing to? Well, Emmanuel Sanders is the leading wide receiver. Love to see that. Four receptions, 76 yards. Then we get into Alvin Kamara, three receptions, 40 yards. Jared Cook, two receptions, 29 yards. And that's basically where he's going to. Um, really would have loved to see Taysom Hill this game on the road, kind of, you know, matching the style of offense that the Chiefs run with the read pass option, the dual threat quarterback. Jalen or uh, Taysom Hill is good, man. He's a starter in the league, I think. 
Um, all right, so that's the Saints. Uh, the Chiefs, Patrick Mahomes can't stop them. 26-47, 254 yards, three touchdowns, no picks. Classic Patrick Mahomes not turning the ball over, making some good decisions. Oh, he did fumble twice, and he did lose one. So he did turn the ball over. How, how foolish. Um, let's see where his lost fumble came in. And it's the fourth quarter. Oof, and the Saints cash in with the touchdown, making it a one-score game. So all these kind of late turnovers we're seeing this uh, this week, not great, not great. All right, Clyde edwards Hilar what a great game on the ground. He had 14 carries, 79 yards. Le'Veon Le Bell, 15 carries, 62 yards. Ooh, Chiefs getting a running game going, running game by committee, 30 carries, and they broke over 150 yards. That's exactly kind of what you want to see. I love it. So not only is, you know, are they, the passing game amazing, the run game on the ground, it's getting there. It's getting there. Love to see it. All right, Travis Kelsey, leading wide receiver for the Chiefs. No surprise there. Eight receptions, 68 yards, and a touchdown. Now, what is surprising is that Tyreek Hill is the third leading wide receiver for only 53 yards. Now, he still had a touchdown, so very well done. I mean, Travis Kelsey with the touchdown, Tyreek Hill with the touchdown. Does I mean, does that surprise anybody? You cannot stop these people. Tyreek Hill is too fast, and Travis Kelsey is just too big and has hands like a wide receiver, so... Saints Chiefs, it actually lived up to the hype. I didn't think it was going to be this close of a game. I thought the Saints were going to get blown out. Um, they really kind of struggled in this game. Fourth quarter, they really kind of got it together because of a couple mistakes. As we said, the interception that's or the fumble that's led to the touchdown. Chiefs settling for field goals, just kind of making it the two-score game. And the Saints just kind of getting it done. I don't want to really say in garbage time um, because what are they down here? They're down 29-15 with 11 minutes left. That's not really too much garbage time, but it's enough of, of kind of garbage time where the Chiefs aren't kind of pressing 100% and kind of giving it 100% on offense, if that makes sense. Um, but, you know, Saints make it a little bit closer. They lose. Drew Brees is still injured. Um, I think they kind of ruined their playoff chances by starting him this week. Not good. Alrighty, in the game that we called absolutely perfectly, 49ers, Cowboys, love, I mean, could you believe that the Cowboys were getting four points at one point on Sunday? Crazy. Ended at Cowboys plus three or three and a half. Not really sure where it closed, but it's still plus three for the Cowboys, and they went outright. So this Cowboys defense got out to a fantastic start. A um, couple of turnovers by the 49ers, um, and the Cowboys cash in with touchdowns. It was fantastic to watch. Now, their offense is still not good. They did still struggle a little bit. 49ers were still able to kind of come back and make it competitive. Uh, but here we go with the Cowboys. Andy Dalton, 19 of 33 for 209 yards, two touchdowns, no picks. Did he fumble? Nobody fumbled. Well done. Clean game by the Cowboys. Love to see it. And they forced multiple turnovers on the defense. Love to see that as well. Tony Pollard. I mean, do you think do you think Zeke could uh, could have done this? 12 carries for 70 yards and two touchdowns? I don't think so. I don't think so. So Zeke being out really helped the Cowboys, honestly. Tony Pollard had a fantastic game. Love to see it. He should be the starter. Zeke shouldn't even be starting anymore. I'm over him. Um, not stepping up disrespect it's disrespectful what he's doing to this Cowboys organization and the Cowboys fan and Jerry Jones and Dak Prescott it's all disrespectful to all those people all right CeeDee Lamb leading wide receiver for the Cowboys five receptions 85 yards Tony Pollard second leading wide receiver for the Cowboys the man was doing it all six receptions 63 yards so we had 69 yards on the ground 63 yards through the air Zeke's not doing any of that folks not doing any of that Look at this. Amari Cooper was the least leading wide receiver. Or no, 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 no. I was looking at the rushing category. Take that back. <clears throat> um, Amari Cooper, he only had two catches for 10 yards. How crazy is that? And they still put up 41 points. Not going to your number one wide receiver, Andy Dalton. I don't know, man. I don't know. Still not trusting this Cowboys offense. We just like this defense. It's it's getting there. It's getting better. And this 49ers offense is not good. Nick Mullins, 21 of 36, 219 yards, two touchdowns, two picks. Where did his picks come from? Uh, first pick in the fourth quarter. Second pick in the fourth quarter. How the heck do you throw two picks in the fourth quarter, you garbage boy? And didn't you fumble? Yeah, you fumbled in the first quarter. You were one of these two fumbles in the first half. You were one of these two fumbles. So, 
Not good by Nick Mullins. Not good by this 49ers offense. This Cowboys defense is very decent, folks. They are getting there. Maybe put them in the top 10 of defenses for the last couple of weeks. Forcing turnovers. I mean... The muff punt here, you know, leads to a field goal or leads to a touchdown by the Cowboys. The fumble by Nick Mullins leads to a touchdown by the Cowboys. And, you know, they've got themselves up 17-7 in the first quarter. Fantastic. Very well done. So, 49ers, they're done. They can't make the playoffs. Their offense is not good. Richard Sherman, you know, he was talking about leaving, so we knew their defense wasn't going to be kind of, you know, 100% as a unit together, and the Cowboys take advantage. They get the win. Maybe still, you know, maybe can still make a push for the NFC East. Probably not. Um, Cowboys, I think the matchup just aligned here for the 49ers. They get, the defense got going early, helped out the offense. So, very well done by the Cowboys getting the win. And then that brought us to the Browns and the Giants, and we told you all not to take the Giants plus six because Freddie Kitchens was calling plays and Colt McCoy was that quarterback, and that's exactly what we thought. Six points. Offense couldn't do anything all game. They scored a field goal in the first quarter, field goal in the fourth quarter. Couldn't do anything this entire game. Now, a little bit surprising that this Browns only this Browns team only put up 20 points. A little surprising. Um, this Giants defense, you know, they're pretty good. How the Seattle did not a lot of points, holding the Browns to 20. So, you know, this is a silver lining if you're the Giants fan going forward into the next season. You've got a pretty good, pretty solid defense. And when you get Saquon Barkley back with Daniel Jones and... Um, you know, Jason Carrots, you know, back calling plays and not having COVID anymore. You know, this Giants team could be pretty good because the NFC East is not that great, you know, by itself. So Giants could take advantage next year. All right, let's go to the Browns. We'll start with the Browns. Baker Mayfield, this man is not turning the ball over, and I absolutely love it, folks. This man... What is up with all these players that usually turn the ball over and not turn the ball over? Josh Allen, Baker Mayfield, and this is what happens when you don't turn the ball over, folks. You win 10 games with two games left. Fantastic work. We have to start commending Baker Mayfield and start giving this man a little bit of respect because everybody clowns this man instantly when he's trash. Let's start giving this man some praise when he's not, you know, when he's doing what he's supposed to do and, you know, taking, you know, the criticism and fixing it, not turning it over. Start praising this man. Let's give this man a little bit of respect, and that's what we're doing here. So very well done to Baker Mayfield. 27 of 32, five incompletions. Fantastic work. 297 yards, not even dink and dunk. So fantastic work again. Two touchdowns. Fantastic work again. No t no interceptions. Fantastic again. Um, Nick Chubb, a little bit of an off game for him. Really couldn't get the running game going. 15 carries, 50 yards, one touchdown. It's good. It's a good stat line, but not nothing, you know, incredible. Uh, Kareem Hunt, seven carries for only 21 yards. So once again, three yards a carry. That's average. That's what the running game was last night when it's usually very, very above average. Um, kind of second best running attack in the league behind, behind the Ravens. So couldn't get anything going on the running game. And Baker Mayfield still kind of two touchdowns passing. Oh, it's all on me. It's all on me, baby. We can't get it done through the running attack. Let me be, you know, the beacon of the offense. Let us let me be, you know, the one that's going out here and getting us the points. And, you know, it, it's me, you know, helping the running game and not the running pass and running game helping me pass. So very well done by Baker Mayfield. Super impressed by this man. Rashad Higgins, leading receiver for the Browns, 76 yards. Jarvis Landry, second leading wide receiver for the Browns, 61 yards. He had a touchdown. Donovan People Jones, third leading wide receiver for the Browns, 55 yards. Rashad Higgins, he is a wide receiver, correct? Yes. Yeah, so Baker Mayfield going to his actual weapons, not just dinking and dunking with, you know, tight ends and running backs. Love to see it, man. This man's really evol evolving, really taking that next step. Love it. All right, we'll talk about the Giants quickly. Colt McCoy, 19 of 31, 221 yards, no touchdowns, no picks, not doing anything. Alfred Morris, love to see this man back in action. Seven carries for him, 39 yards, no touchdowns. Wayne Gallman, nine carries, <clears throat> 29 yards, no touchdowns. So we really have to talk about this. What the heck is this man doing, the head coach for the Giants? I, I'm forgetting it. Joe Judge, he made some very, very questionable calls right from the rip. The first one being you're on Cleveland's eight-yard line, fourth and five, and you go for it. 
You 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 run a fake field goal? I mean, come on, man. Trust your offense or not trust your offense. You are an underdog fighting for a division at home on prime time against a very good team. You need to take the points whenever you can, and the Giants didn't do that. And if they did do that, if they did take the points, this game would have been very close, and probably the Giants could have won it. So they don't get three here. Uh, they get it again. They, I mean, they're on Cleveland six, fourth and two. Once again, they go for it. Not a fake field goal. They just go for it and don't get it. But that's another three points that you could have made. So now we're at six points. Add six points to the Giants. Um, what else do we have? What else did we have? Was there another one? There may have been another one here. This game went very quickly. A lot of long drives here. Um, I mean, look at uh, none of these teams had a lot of possessions. The Giants had one, two, three, four possessions. Really only three. The end of half one doesn't even count. The Browns had three possessions. So both these teams have three possessions in the first half. Games can go quickly, folks. Games can truly go quickly. That's why we don't take anything over 13 and a half points in the first half because you know, when you only get three possessions, we're not going to count that you score two point or two touchdowns on you know both of them and a field goal on the last one. So that's why we don't take anything over thirteen and a half. If you wanted to know why. So, I mean, with those, you know, not a lot of possessions, so six points definitely haunt you. I get you want to be aggressive, and you, you know, but this is not the time. You don't have your starting quarterback. You don't have your starting offensive coordinator. Just take the points when they come. Could have been a little bit more competitive. Some questionable coaching calls here. Um, that's why I think Jason Garrett needs to be promoted to offensive coordinator, but, you know, that's just me. Um, who was Colt McCoy going to? Darius Slayton, leading receiver for the Giants, four receptions, 74 yards. Sterling Shepard, four receptions, 51 yards. Evan Ingram, four receptions, 46 yards. So I actually like that Colt McCoy was actually going to his weapons. I'll give him that. Evan Ingram being his fourth, fourth, or third leading wide receiver, that's pretty impressive because that man's a great catching tight end, great safety blanket. So I'll give Colt McCoy some credit for, you know, going to his receivers, putting up 200 yards, no no turnovers. That's good. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, his offense didn't lead to any points, so it's unfortunate. All righty, that is going to do it for us today. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for watching. We just laid the groundwork for talking week 16. Tomorrow we come at you with our power rankings, the cash and trash list, and our uh, breakdown of th uh, Monday Night Football. And I almost forgot. This would have been the second week in a row. I forgot. Uh, Moneymaker, today's game, Steelers, Bengals. Let's uh, update this line here. Can we get this line updated? Here we go. Steelers are minus 14. Gosh darn. We got to swallow it, folks. We're going to swallow the 14. Um, Steelers minus 14. That's going to be our moneymaker. The Bengals, they put up seven, folks. They, they're going to put up only seven points. The Steelers defense is going to hold them only seven. That's what the Bengals can only score anyway, seven points. Now, can the Steelers offense get back on track? Primetime game on the road. Can they? Hopefully. We're going we're gonna to risk it. We're going to risk it. We'll go Steelers minus the 14 here. Um, it's the Bengals. They put up seven. So we got to expect the, the Steelers to put up more than seven. And uh, hopefully we trust them to do so. Hopefully they go out and do so. Not only for, to, for us to win the bet, but just for the Steelers' sake in the playoffs, getting that kind of monkey off their back. They just lost two straight games. Everybody's questioning them. Everybody's questioning their offense mostly. So if they can get back on track this week, it will help them tremendously. Um, going into the playoffs. Alrighty, so now we're done. We'll be back tomorrow, noon Eastern, live, talking cash and trash list, power rankings, yesterday's game, or today's game. Um, yeah. Alright, thanks for coming out. Thanks for watching.